Let's look in Luke chapter 15 uh, together as we look and see the principle of what Jesus is teaching in this parable. Now, a parable is a story. It is a fictitious story that Jesus used to be able to apply in common words to them so they could understand it. I, for one, like it whenever someone tells me in a way that I can understand it. There are times where things go over my head and it doesn't make sense to me. And someone will say, no, Johnny, it's like this. And they'll put it in, in layman's terms. I go, oh, I get that. Why didn't you just say that in the beginning? I would have got that easy. And, and they're like, well, I just told it in a way that you can understand. And this is what Jesus is doing in the culture in which he lives, gives examples so that they can understand the morals and the principles that he is teaching on how you can honor God with the life that you live and the lessons that he is trying to convey to them. That's what a parable is. Now, in this parable, in the Gospel of Luke chapter 15, there's actually three stories that Jesus tells in this parable that he starts And the reason that he's telling this story is because we're going to read together in verse 1, and you'll see why he's telling this story, this parable, to the people surrounding him. Here's what it says. Let's read together verse 1. It says, Now the tax collectors, the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. Now, tax collectors, you have to understand, were not the respected in society. They would take from people, take more than they should. They got their wealth from stealing. In a lot of ways, they were basically criminals, con men, stuff like that. They were not there. Whoever was like, man, well, I'm so glad I got a friend and a tax collector. They were kind of rejected. They weren't very popular people. They made their living on taking. Sinners, obviously, in the setup of where they are, to be considered a sinner means that you don't fit into the standards and the rules and the Jewish customs that they have. It is someone who had turned their back on everything that they knew to be godly, the law of God, and was going to live in rebellion against it. That's who they're talking about. Jesus drew these kind of people to himself. They gathered around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered. Now, mutter doesn't mean that they stood up and they questioned Jesus to his face. It basically is a backdoor way of saying, hey, Jesus, turn around so we can talk behind your back for a minute. They said, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. I mean, what kind of nerve does this man have? The ones that we have deemed not, not important, not worthy, the outcasts, the ones who've turned their back, why is it that he is eating with them? Now, just because they muttered it doesn't mean Jesus didn't hear it or Jesus didn't know. So because they're missing the point of the whole reason that God sent Jesus to this earth to live a sinless life, he puts it in layman's terms in a parable and begins to teach them about the value of lost things. So in the first story that we read that Jesus tells, Jesus tells a story about the lost sheep. He told of a man who had a 100 sheep, and he discovered that one was missing. So he left the 90 and 9 and went seeking the lost sheep. And when he found the lost sheep, he threw it over his shoulders and brought it home because you have to understand that you got to bring it back home. Sometimes it takes an effort. you got to go looking for it, and sometimes the shepherd would have to take his staff and break the leg of the lamb and carry it back home because in his ignorance it ran away. And so he put it over his shoulder and brought it back home and was happy because that which was lost had been found. Now, a lot of people will say, but he had 99 still there. Why was he worried about the one? Because Jesus is putting the value on the one that was lost. And he called his neighbors together, and they rejoiced because the one had been found. Jesus said there was more rejoicing over the one lost sheep than the 99 sheep that didn't need finding. There also you see that Jesus makes the example and says that all of heaven rejoices when that one sinner comes home. In the second story, Jesus tells of a lady with a necklace or maybe a head decoration that had 10 coins in it, and the 10 coins made it a unit. She lost one of the coins. The woman searched the furniture, swept the house diligently. Look, we know, look, we know how this goes when the remote gets lost. You're like, the remote's big enough, it ought to not fit into the crack of the couch, but somehow it gets in there. Take all the cushions off the pillows. You turn every piece of furniture. Next thing you know, you hear that thing slide from one end of the couch to the other, and you're like, give me the knife, baby. I'm finna cut this thing open. Remotes are important. 
saves us a lot of energy. Or if you've ever lost a piece of jewelry. Or if you ever lose your keys. Now, losing keys is a normal occurrence around my house. So they have these tiles that they put on them. So they can see where they left them because inevitably, when you lose something and you're flipping everything upside down looking for it, genius has come up with this awesome question. Where'd you have it last? Just for kicks and giggles. Has anyone ever asked you that? And you went, there it is. Hadn't thought of that yet. I'm so glad God sent you a man of wisdom or a person of just great, elaborate wisdom to help me remember, oh, it's where you left it last. Or they go, hey, you mind if I ask crazy questions? I mean, look, like this past weekend, we get back to the boat launch, and someone forgot their keys, lost, lost their keys. They turning that boat upside down down. And everything in me just wanted to be like, where'd you leave it last? But I'm trying not to get baptized in the water. And then I'm sitting there going, man, I just wonder how much I can, do you mind if I look? Like, oh no, we have two eyes too, dummy. (laughs) We've looked through everything, but hey, maybe you can see better than all of us. And so I'm careful. Like, Because then things show up in the weirdest places, right? But when something's lost of value, you will flip, turn the world upside down looking for it. Chargers. What a precious commodity. And a household of thieves. I mean, where's my charger? Not a charger. Where's my charger? I got backups. When they find out where the backups are, I'm telling you, it'll test test the integrity of a person. This woman searched the furniture, swept the house diligently. She got everything clean, lit a candle to look under things, and she eventually found the lost coin. There's a lesson to be learned that don't quit looking for what's lost till you find it. And when she found it, she called the neighbor ladies together, and they celebrated the fact that she found what was lost. And she was grateful she had found her coin, and they put it back where it belonged. So Jesus is making the point with them, and they're like, oh, yeah, it was lost sheep. I get that. That's valuable. Lost coin? Man, I would look for the coin. But now Jesus is going to bring home the very reason that they were questioning things. You see, when it comes to parables, you have to understand the context and the culture of the story that Jesus is telling so you don't just read through it like, oh, yeah, that's cool. It's no big deal. What Jesus is about to tell them is going to wreck at the core everything that they know in their culture to be true and the way it should have been handled is not the way it was handled, so it's going to wreck them on the inside of everything that they know in this story called the prodigal son. But truly, it can be called the story of the lost two brothers or the unfailing love of a father. It's a story filled with betrayal, restoration, with some frustration. There's so much in this story that we don't have time today to cover everything, but we're going to do our best to go through it and see what Jesus is trying to teach them and then see what it means for us today. So in Luke chapter 15, starting in verse 11, this passage and the breakdown side of it is what you're going to read together with me this morning. And we're going to break it down together and say, what is Jesus teaching them that we can learn from this today? So it may be a little more teachy than preachy, but teaching is good too. Amen. It's 11, 11. All right, we got time. And I'll take all the time it takes till you're ready. We're going to look at this story together. There's going to be some teaching. And we're going to have some teaching, but we're going to end with some preaching. Is that going to be okay? All right. It's going to be, let's, let's get together. I guess I'm going to have to get serious with y'all. Take the glasses off. Verse 11, Jesus continued. After he's told the other two stories, he continues with this. When he's wrapping it up, he says, there was a man who had two sons. You got to understand the value of having two sons, and that, that was a valuable possession, a legacy that was left for the man. And so his two sons, this pride and joy. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. 
So he divided his property between them. Now, something major has happened here. We're going to talk about it in just a second, but we can read over that and not think it's that big of a deal. Verse 13 says, Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. What is wild living? It's bad. It's scandalous. It is, it is reckless. It is abandoned. It is the rejection of everything they know to be godly and the mindset that they know of everything that is right. And is saying, I'm going to waste my joy, my effort, my energy on everything that represents the world and its pleasures, and I'm going to reject the knowledge of God and all the blessing that come with it. That's wild living. After he spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. So check it, y'all. The son comes to the father and says, give me my share. See, the original listeners, the Pharisees, the ones surrounding Jesus as he's teaching this lesson, the original listeners would have been amazed by such a request. Not that there was anything uh, special about a son expecting an inheritance of the family wealth, but in those days when a father died, the oldest son received a double portion of what the other children would inherit. So if a father had two sons, the oldest would have gotten two-thirds of the estate and the younger would have received one-third. But the division of the estate only occurred when the father had died. So here, what the son is asking him is much deeper than what we see as a simple question or a command. What the younger son is going to his father and saying is such a deep sign of disrespect while his father's still living and say, I wish you were dead. Give me what you owe me. The younger son was saying essentially, I want my father's things, but I don't want you. His relationship to his father had been a means to an end of enjoying the wealth and the provision of what he had given him. He wanted out, and he wanted out what he wanted now. He wanted it right then. He said, give me what is mine. And the father's response is more startling than even the request that the son gave. Because the father did what? He gave it to him. So in a patriarchal society, it's with lavish expressions of deference and respect for elders that is so different than a lot of the custom that we see today. Like my dad would tell me, like, it didn't matter who they were. If an older man spoke to me and he asked me a question, I responded not with, yeah, huh? It was, yes, sir. No, sir. Sir, my kids to this day, and it's a, it's a good habit. I'm not saying it's the law, but my kids, I'll ask them something. I'm like, hey, did you get there? They'll go, huh? I'll be like, are you talking to some punk in the schoolyard? Uh, sir, and then someone like, oh, drill sergeant, sir, oh, sir, sir, you do. Now I'm trying to teach my kids respect because this culture is not teaching them respect. I say, ma'am, and no, ma'am, to people younger than me. Why? Because it's respect. Look, our world needs some respect. We can agree on that or disagree on it, and it may not be the sir and the ma'am that you say, but there's a lot of disrespect in our culture, and I'm doing the minimal things to try and rebuild cultural respect and honor in the integrity of it. So this guy, out of respect, there's supposed to be this great respect for his father's wishes and what the, the set of the culture would be, and he defies that. See, in a traditional Middle Eastern father's response would have been expected to do this. He would have driven the son out of the family with nothing short of physical blows. The son would have come and said, hey, dad, give me what you owe me, man. And he would have like, what did you just say? You heard me. And he would have said, the devil is a lie. Get your stupid no sense making self out the house in which I provided over your head, and you ain't getting a thing, and I'm going to slap you for being dumb enough to act that way. Now, that's in the redneck approach of it. In the, in the Middle Eastern side of it, he would have cast him from the family and physically threw him out. You have lost your mind, man. That's not what he did. He divided it up and gave it to him. Blows the mind of his listeners. 
It says it, he simply divided the property between them. And to understand the significance of what he's saying in this story, you have to know what the Greek meaning, or what the Greek word property is used here. The Greek word bios, which is used for property, means life. It says the man literally divided his life and gave it to him. Because that's what he asked for. I don't care about you. I don't care about how you feel. I don't care about your heart. I don't care about what you've tried to do. I want what's mine. I will rip your life apart and won't stop till I get what's mine. That's what he's done. I'm like, oh, I just thought he was asking for an early blessing. No, he was defying everything in his culture and honor. The younger brother then asked his father to tear his life apart. And the father does so for the love of the son. They would have never seen a Middle Eastern father do this. And the father patiently endures a tremendous loss of honor as well as the pain of rejected love. Can I tell you what's worse than the loss of honor? Rejected love. Ordinarily, when our love is rejected, we get angry. We retaliate. We do what we can to diminish our affection for the rejecting person so we won't hurt so much. Much. I can remember a time where Gavin and I were having a conversation about something. And I had tried the threatening. I'd, I'd, I went and checked him out of school one time. Trying to, th- He's like, hey, but you got to pull it together in your grades and stuff like that. And he's like, okay. I was like, because we may just have to ship you off. He's like, what? I was like, yeah, bro, no more Sonic checkouts, man. <laughs> but I remember in the time we were looking at, a, at, at, at report cards and stuff, and I said, you know what, Gavin, here's the thing. My dad wasn't a man of God, and I would have never disrespected him this way. And for the first time, it's like the lights went off. Like, oh, it isn't you just trying to make me false about honor. It is about honor. When somebody makes a way for you, you owe them the dignity and respect for the effort that's been put forward so you don't have to deal with the junk that they had to get set free from. You owe that. It's honor. It's honor. Somebody paved a way for you. Honor it. Dad is maintaining his affection for the son and bears the agony. And what did the kid do? He squandered it all away. Wasted every bit of it. Goes to a different country. Now, what you have to understand in the the surrounding areas, what is one of the surrounding areas? Samaria. He goes to a country of a hated people and is serving as a commoner there. No longer a son of an esteemed gentleman, but a slave to a rejection of society. But then he comes home. Verse 17 says, when he came to his senses. And that's what you pray with prodigals. When they come to their senses... He said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. See, it says he began to come to his senses because he realized he was far better off in his father's house. He knows he's disgraced his father by tearing his life apart. See, in those days, it's also understood that in their customs, because of the embarrassment that this son had caused to his father and to his family, that he was believed to justice had been dead to the family. Commentators would say during that time that a son to be received back into the family meant he would have to restore back what he had squandered. But do you understand what broken, poor, squandered everything away people don't have? What they took. So this is what the expectation is. So you have to imagine the scene as the prodigal son is in a pig farm. Just wants some pig slop. Comes to his senses. And then he's got to figure a way to get back in just to go to his father's house, just to figure a way back in. He's trying to to get back. And so he rehearses his return. Man, if I... I'm not even asking to be your son. I'm not even asking for a spot at the table. I'm not even asking for a room in a house. I'll sleep under a tree in a field. Whatever I have, I, I'm just, can I just work at your place? 
You don't ever have to acknowledge me. I'll eat from the ground. I, what, I don't even need, I just, can I come back to this area? Can I come back? Can I just be one of your hired hands? I don't have to be a son. Now, there's genuine authenticity in this. He's not trying to fake his dad's emotions. He knows that his father's hired hands got it better than what is going on with him. So if I could just get back to his house, I don't have to live in his house. If I could just live on his land. If he just let me be one of his commoners, one of his hired hands, I don't even have to be his son because they got it better than I got it. He's wasted everything. And it says in verse 20, so he got up and went to his father. I love what it says here, y'all. It's so good. It says, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son. It's important you remember that. Threw his arms around him and kissed him. He kissed this dirty, no good, sorry, stinky son that rejected him. Now, I don't know what you like to hug and kiss, but I can tell you this, stinky pigsty people ain't one of them. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. If you think honor and respect wasn't a big deal to culture and also biblical principle, then you're not reading the context of what he's saying. Not only what you did to this family, but you rejected the honor and the setup and the system of what I have ordained in the way of blessing you. That's why he didn't respond with, Daddy, I hurt your feelings. My bad. He said, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Verse 22 says, but the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his fingers and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they begin to celebrate. Can you imagine how many days the father looked a long way down the road, hoping for the moment that he would see the, the, the walk of his son coming down that road? And his father sees him, and what does he do? He runs to him. Now, theologians believe there are two reasons that he ran. Number one, because of the love the father has, the compassion that he has. The second one was to protect him from the neighbors. Because let me tell you what your neighbors don't like. When you dishonor their friend. It was saying, you don't have to get even with him. I got it. You don't have to take care of it. This is mine. He ran to him, the distinguished, dignified father. See, as a general rule, distinguished Middle Eastern patriarchs don't run. Children might run. Women might run. Young men might run. But not this guy. Surely he would not pick up his robe and bare his legs like some boy, but he does. This would have assuredly taken the younger brother by surprise. The son tries to roll out his plan for restitution, and the father interrupts him and says, not only am I going to ignore your rehearsed speech, son, but I'm directly going to contradict it and say, quick, servants, get the best robe and put it on him. Get him a ring. Let's kill the fatted calf, and let's throw a party because my dead lost son came home. He was saying to him, I'm not going to just take you back, son. I'm going to cover your nakedness, your poverty, your rags with robes for my office and my honor. And it wasn't quite the response he thought he would receive, but it's a lesson to every one of us that when we've been lost and we make the first step towards Jesus, he's going to run to us and he's going to cover us. He's going to clothe us and he's going to give us what we don't deserve. This is his reception. Different than he had thought it would go. He commands that the servants prepare a feast. The fattened calf, you got to understand, the fattened calf was saved for the best. Most meals in that society did not include meat because it was an expensive delicacy. We kind of get the feeling now. I think some people turned to vegetarian because it got expensive. Meat was often reserved for special occasions and parties, but no meat more expensive than the fattened calf. I mean, because you would think, hey, hey, you know that calf that walks weird. Oh, skinny calf, ain't eating, they ain't letting him eat. Go get the scrawny calf that's about to die anyway. Let's kill old barely got ribs calf. Barbecue that for this reject. I'd have been like, I'd have been surveying him like, oh, I'm glad you're home, but man, really? 
Somebody got a goat? <laughs> Kills a fattened calf, the very best of what he has. And you got to understand what's so important to it. Why he would throw a feast? Because verse 7, when he started this parable in the beginning, before the other, after he told the first story, he says, all of heaven rejoices when what? When one lost sinner comes home. There was music, y'all, and there was dancing. I know that's a struggle for some of y'all. It was a celebration not just for the family, but the whole community who had seen and heard what had happened. And they were celebrating the return. And God spared nothing. This father spared nothing. God spares nothing at the expense of our return to him. But there's three characters in the story, the loving father, the degenerate son, and the older brother. Here's what it says in verse 25. We're moving quickly if you can listen quickly. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard the music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. Furious was the older brother. The older brother became angry and refused to go in, showing his disapproval. And check out what happened with the father. Because who's Jesus talking to? The people that didn't understand why Jesus was letting these broken, lost, degenerate people come to him. The ones who thought they were better. The ones who, keepers and experts of the law. They're more like the older brother. They thought they would get off the hook. Well, the daddy, he shouldn't have done it. I'd have slapped that guy. I wouldn't have hugged him up. You know, good, good for the daddy. Oh, the son came to his senses. That's a good story, Jesus. Oh, the older brother? I wonder who he's talking to. He must be talking to somebody else. He ain't talking to us. I'm missing for somebody else to get this. Just like we sit in church week after week and think the preacher's talking to everybody else but us. Older brother became angry. Furious was this kid. I ain't going in. And I love how God showed grace to the one who took the step home and the one who refused to party with him. The father did what? He says he went out and pleaded with him. See, we do a really good job of really trying to paint the Pharisees as terrible people, but can I tell you, the grace of Jesus was as much for the Pharisees as it was the rejection of society. And he answered his father, look. All these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But then he takes another jab in verse 30. But when this son of yours, husbands and wives, you know this. Wife calls you when you're coming home. Why? I mean, probably normal time. Because that son of yours, oh. Thought that was our baby. No, that was our baby boy. Oh, he's yours when he does something good. He's all mine when he does something dumb. It's just being like his daddy. Your mama. So, so it gets, he says, this son of yours, not my brother, but when my brother squandered away the property, he didn't say it. He said, but this son of yours, I've disowned him. Why haven't you? He says, when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. And he says in verse 31, my son, the father said, you're always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Even though both sons are wrong, the father cares for them and invites them both back into the love and the feast. Equally wrong, but each one is not equally dangerous. The ironies of the parable is now revealed. The younger son's flight from the father was crashingly obvious. He left the father literally, physically, and morally. Though the older son stayed at home, he was actually more distant and alienated from the father than the brother that left because he was blind to his true condition. See, the older bro brother was focused on what he didn't have instead of celebrating what he never lost. The older brother obeyed his father to get his things. Just like we have to understand, we don't obey God 
to get things. We obey God to get God Himself in order to resemble Him, love Him, know Him, and delight in Him. Not just to be moral people. See, religious and moral people can avoid Jesus as a Savior and as a Lord as much as the younger brothers who say they don't believe in God and define right and wrong for themselves. See, this older brother felt like he had the right to tell his father how the robes, the rings, and the livestock of the family should be deployed. And in the same way, spiritually arrogant people commonly live very moral lives, but their goal is to get leverage over God, to control what God better do for them, to put them in a position where they think God owes me. Can I tell you, God doesn't owe you anything. God gave you his very best in Jesus, and if you receive Jesus, he doesn't owe you another thing. You can't do enough good to make God's hand be forced to do certain things for you. God, if I, if I, if I give uh, more than 10%, are you going to show you? You're going to have to do this because, God, I did this. No, because if you're controlling him, he's not controlling you. He's not your co-pilot. And a lot of American Christianity is about God doing something for the good thing you did instead of just being grateful for the great thing Jesus did for you, to know him and to make him known. See, if you believe God ought to bless you and help you because you work so hard to obey Him and be a good person, here's the issue. Jesus may be your helper, He may be your example, and even your inspiration, but He's not your Savior. You are serving your own Savior. If you got to get patted on the back for every good thing you do, you're not doing it for Him, you're doing it for yourself. And when you don't get noticed, you get mad when somebody else does. Does it sound familiar? Hello, American church. If we build a building and your name ain't on the brick, uh uh-oh. If you make a suggestion and somebody doesn't take it, why? Because we live in a society where everything's what we want. But God's not concerned with what we want. He's concerned with His will being carried out. And we're not serving Him just to get things because things isn't what comes. Obedience comes from a life honored by God that we get to be blessed. I'm not serving God to get things. You're not serving God to get junk. You're not using God to get stuff. But if God blesses you, you use that stuff to change people's lives. Think about it. This dude's serving his own Savior complex. Understand this. He never lost a thing, and he still wasn't happy. Was any less of his inheritance going to be? Was he going to lose some more of it because the son came back? No. He was still going to rightfully receive everything that was promised to him. But he was mad. And he was as guilty as the listeners that were mad about the sinners and the tax collectors. Remember why Jesus is telling the story. The enemy's fine with you being religious as long as you don't fall in love with the one who gave you the reason. You're like, ah, all right parables three points of the story we take away today remember how it started he just wanted to come home can I tell you today no matter how far you are from God you can always come home I know a lady that grew up in a pastor's home legalistic more of a holiness church She left pursuing a relationship with a guy, moved out, moved in with him. They left the state, went a long ways away. Many, many, many states between them, many thousands and thousands of miles between them. She's living with this guy, dishonoring the wishes of her parents. She lived in a house and she obeyed their rules for the most part until she got old enough she didn't have to. Like she knew that her parents had a Lord, that their Lord never became her Lord. That was really all it was. Knowing right from wrong and choosing to do the wrong goes with the man. They become pregnant. She tells the man, I mean, for some hope of longevity, we're going to have a family together. We're gonna, I'm pregnant. To which his response is, hey, you need to go get an abortion. Well, that wasn't quite the response she was expecting. Don't you love me? Don't you want to be with Can you imagine all the feelings that she's having? From someone, it wasn't like it was a one-night stand or something. It was some, a com, supposedly committed relationship. But now it's inconveniencing him. So here's what happens. 
says that to him, and they have a conversation. And he says, I want you to get an abortion. And then she's just torn apart. And he leaves, and she's thinking, what can I do? I've disgraced my parents. I'd hate to call them. And still, but she didn't know who else to call, so she called her mom, and her mom answered the phone. Hello? Hey, this is. Tells the situation. She says, well, I'm pregnant. She says, okay. She said, he wants me to get an abortion. And her mama says, well, that's not nice. She starts crying, and she said the most powerful words that you can ever say to someone who's far away. Honey, you can come home. She did. She told me that story with tears running down her face. One of the most awesome phrases you can ever hear is, baby, you can come home. I don't care how far you are from God and what you've done to squander away. I, I'm not as interested in the details of your misery and the miserable squandering away, defeated junk that you have been a part of and that you have participated in. It's just more important to me that you come home. That you come home to Jesus. And He will run to you. And the way that the story says, I traveled for a season with opportunity to help an organization and we'd go and we'd sing and raise money for their, their calls and used to sing this old school song that it's called When God Ran. Talked about the attributes of God and it says, but the only time I ever saw him run was when he ran to me. He took me in his arms, held my head to his chest and said, my son's come home again, then lifted my face, wiped the tears from my eyes and with forgiveness in his voice, he says, son, do you know I still love you? He ends the chorus with he caught me by surprise when God ran. Listen to me, you can come home. Today, maybe you're not far from God, but maybe you have a prodigal. Maybe you have a prodigal that's broken your heart and squandered their life and they're living reckless and they have walked away. Can I tell you, I want to encourage you today, never stop looking down the road looking for them. Don't stop looking for them to make that walk. Keep watching and waiting for your promise to come home. It may be painful, it may be agonizing. You may not understand. But you know what can happen? Just like Jesus said in the story, He came to His senses. Pray, God, let them come to their senses. Never give up. But then at the end of the story, we get to learn a lesson about most of us. The way you celebrate someone else's freedom that they have found defines how much freedom you really have. Do you have a heart like the Father's who's one's willing to be inconvenient so that others might be brought back to God? A heart like the Father's that feels sorrow for when it sees someone crippled and broken by sin, not just disgusted with the sin? Yeah, it's okay to be disgusted, but you're not happy that they're stuck in it. A heart like the Father's that will go looking for the lost and do whatever, go running to them and do whatever it helps it takes to help them find the love of God. But do you understand that the goal of having church is not to get up here and be like, oh, there's so many jacked up, messed up, sinful, nasty living, worse people. They're terrible. And everybody's like, amen, they're terrible. The world's lost. It's going to hell in a handbasket. Okay. It is. But who's supposed to be the ones that show them the example of Jesus? Who's the sinners and tax collectors of our society? that have a chance. Did Jesus become sin to the sinner? No. Did Jesus go get drunk? Was he a drunkard so he could win drunk people? No. But he talked to drunk people. He hung out with commoners. But he wasn't willing to sacrifice his calling and his purpose because had he done that, there would be no redemption. He stayed the course. So my goal today is not, not just for us to come to the reality like, oh, I might have some things in me. They have, look, can I tell you, there are people that need Jesus, and when they come to church, you ought to be happy they're there because if they find Jesus, it's going to change their life. Why? Because he supposedly changed yours. And if he can change your life, he can change anybody's. Amen?
God is no respecter of persons. He doesn't play favorites in a sense of where you think that you're better than somebody else and you deserve more than anyone else. Can I tell you that we have an opportunity, no matter the pain or the disgust that we feel, that people need a chance when they have messed their life up and their wild living, that they get a chance to come home. I'm thankful that I got a chance at 19 years old to come home to find out what home really was, to experience what family truly is. And I believe it's what the hope of the church is. We understand our calling is to show the expensive love, the extravagant love of a father who looks and waits. And then when those that are far, they get a chance to come. I want you to stand with you. Stand with me today on your feet together. And I want you to bow your hearts with me. I want you to bow your heads, close your eyes. In just a moment, no one leave. I'm going to wrap quickly. Today, if you're far from God, listen to me. If you're far from God, I don't have to give a list of what it is that separated you from God. You know. If you're far from God, it's time to come home. It is time to come home. Take the step towards God. And in all His glory and His honor, He will meet you. Come home today. Today, Maybe you have that prodigal, that kid that is far from God, that family member that is far from God, and you are, your heart is broken. Your heart is broken. And can I tell you, it's not time to give up. It's not time to give up. Don't get weary and well-doing for a due season. Or you will reap a harvest if you don't quit. May you be encouraged today. Be praying they come to their senses and when they do, show them the extravagant love of Jesus. Then today, if you see any bit of that older brother in your life, just know this. God's grace is for the hard-hearted as much as it is for the reckless living. In the blindness that we don't see in and of ourselves, God's grace sweeps in and comes to us. So today, today if you need to come home, all you have to do is just like the son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you. I'm not even worthy to be called your son or your daughter. For you, you may have to say that today. Ladies, you may have to say as your daughter, I'm not even worthy to be called your child. And you know what he'll do? He will lift your face and he will embrace you and he will kiss you and make you his own. By confession, repentance, and a life declared for him. Today, confess that Jesus is Lord, your Lord and your Savior. Be saved today. Hold on to that promise, Mama, Daddy. Hold on to it. Hold on to that promise, Grandma. Hold on to it. Hold on to the hope. And be set free from any blindness that will rob you from an opportunity to be the one that shows the world that desperately needs Jesus how to receive it. So, Father, today, that's my hope and our prayer. Lord, today that you would do that. Lord, that you would speak to us through the story that you told that would be relevant to us today. That we learn exactly what you want to do in our life. Be lifted high. Be lifted up in our lives so that the lost can be found. And so the found can be free. In Jesus' name.